Hey everyone, welcome back. It's Lucid and I am joined by Sai. Hi, it's Sai and I'm joining Lucid. <laughs> so it looks like our wish has finally been granted. We've got some hot PvP action going on here. And it looks like it's mostly between, we've got a 2v1 going here against the poor elves. And we've got a bit of fighting between Zabalba and Jomen. So pretty excited to see what happens here. Yeah. So Jomen is an interesting target, um, but I can see why Shababa went for them just basically based on the shape of their border, where Jomen had basically taken both of the provinces in between them. And those are both provinces in flight range from Shababa's capital. It just probably felt very easy to go push on the person who you might see as being a little bit overreaching in terms of the borders that they've set for themselves, essentially, while those provinces are very vulnerable and easy for you to contest. Yeah, and, you know, Jomen took basically the late configuration and didn't have an Awake Expander to get into it. So that's going to deny him resources for his cap to limit how much he can produce. You know, it's one less cap circle on, on of land provinces to give resources and less provinces to, like, give income. And Zabalba can get in that lake easier than Jomen can, too. So even though right now they're, they're not making their frogs, they're making bats, but they, they will be able to make bats pretty easily. I mean, our frogs. So, yeah, and if they can get there, that's uh, they can even put up underwater forts. Right. Okay, so let's start with a message from Ulm. Chichello here. Sounds like Arco pissed off Jomen on Borders 2. Arco sent Brax a hilarious message this turn, basically saying he wants all three provinces along our border in exchange for the West provinces he was a psycho to take in the first place. I can't tell if he's trying to be funny or not, but he's got a career as a comedian. Okay, so we have hostilities rising between Ulm and Arco. Yeah, we'd kind of seen that before, though. Right. And then I had been, we'd both been expecting them to start fighting right away, and then that didn't happen. Right. It, things definitely do seem to be veering in that direction where they're going to be taking a war, but it's, it's, we're going to have to wait and see how serious of a war that's going to become. Yeah, and it doesn't look to be a war that, at least on paper, is going to favor Ulm, so. Right, yeah, when we were talking about the unit matchup, he doesn't really have anything that's particularly good against those hard companions in particular, so he's definitely going to want to have some magic online, which right. he's going to be particularly bad at because he's drain Ulm. Yeah, and the things that he does have that kind of work, like rangers, he's kind of just starting to get them, so... You know, whether he can hit like the critical mass of rangers that might be able to deal with the heart companions better, we'll see. But but Arco might even be able to do things like put Howl up or stuff that can kind of it won't completely confuse the the crossbow targeting AI, but it's not gonna help for, for Ohm. Yeah, and Arco's well, Arco did actually go serve for some priests early, so he's not pure mystics. So his research isn't going to be quite as fast as that some LA Arcos can get, but he is going to be able to probably research a fair bit faster than Ulm. Yeah. All right. Next up, we have a messenger from Merignon. Barbarians dot 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 dot. Yeah. Only the first. <laughs> that was only the first attack that he had. He's right. not even talking about the two event chains that he has. Right. Yeah. I, I wonder if he's fully noticed this. Like, really, he this this should be shame for him for getting to put that commander on retreat. And he did take misfortune skills too, right? Yep, misfortune too. Okay. Message. And turmoil one, which enables another barb event. Oh, really? Okay. A message from Micklin. Doing the Jaguar shuffle to take advantage of all these frozen rivers. It's so nice we get to build all these palisades without anyone being mean to us. I hope they like cats. Zan. I feel like there's some Micklin meme that can be done with like a like crazy cat lady or something, you know? Like pretender names or something. Yeah, I mean, you do get the Ozolotls. Yep. Okay, TNG. Nap three with Ohm. Getting my... Oh, nap three with Ohm with my getting of 95. Nap three with Pythium. He'd, be, he'd been stalling on reply for the last few turns, and I think the army showing up on his border helped to secure that. Overall, satisfied with expansion. While I'd have liked to have been bigger, as one always does... It's about the most one can hope for in a multiplayer game and get naps with all neighbors but one for a rush like this. I'm very glad to have lost almost nothing in expansion. Using six H1s I made in the first two turns as my leaders 
let my Dom six build spam a lot of ancestors later in expansion, but then comes with significant risk of commander snipe, even if one's troops don't love switching to archery at the wrong time as much as T and cheese do. And that, yeah, the problem is if they switch to archery at the wrong time, the battles are going to drag out, which gives you more time to get your commander shot. And while my research is abysmal, I've got the tools to immobilize vans. Since casualties have been low, I've spent all my gold on military power. We're in such a good military position for an invasion of Midgard, or we're in as about as good as, of a position for the invasion of Midgard as one can hope for. I'm not sure it'll be easy even so. With the minimal stats on our bless, vans are superior in a straight fight. Midgard has a fort up on one on the backside of his cap circle, potentially with a lot of gold to spend on Einherr and PD dumps. I sadly cannot move. Map move two attacks this turn due to winter, so I can't hit the whole border in force. So I'll have to hope that Midgard does not see the attack coming. I've been careful to not mention Midgard to anyone but Agartha as a target and not put much on the border. I don't know, there was decent bound on the border last turn. At least all the, the foreign recruit stuff was there. But this is yeah. a really good thing about... I think it's probably a mistake a lot of players can slip up into, is like, oh, I'm going to attack somebody, and then you like tell all that player's neighbors like to attack them. Like, they're definitely going to get word. So... Yeah. In this case, I think the 2 one should be plenty as well. Right. And that's the other thing. Like, I, I think, you know newer players can make this mistake more is you want like as many players in on the coalition as you can because the war is going to be more secure. Well, it's also going to be a lot less spoils. So if you think you can win a 1v1, you know, do that. If you think it's going to take a 2v1, then that might be more ideal. But like, if you think you need a 3v1 for your first war, unless you're like trying to take out Lemuria or something, it's probably a bad idea. <laughs> yeah, and then the other thing though is that even if you can win a 1v1, Having a 2v1 can make that win much more decisive, so you don't take as many losses and you can wrap up the war much more quickly. Right. Okay, moving on to Joman. The Arca player is making some absolute wild claims, graciously allowing me to get the water provinces in my cap ring and explaining to me that he is on his way to take the land I've already taken. He clearly didn't have scouts to show that I expanded into those provinces. I hear that he's made this type of diplo with every single neighbor he borders. Sounds like he's either trying to make a Diplo power move or making his neighbors real tired of that type of gunpoint Diplo real early. Time will tell. Okay. So yeah, it sounds like... <laughs> I kind of hope well, that, Ar that Arco stays in the game for a long time just so we can see how this gameplay, like this, this diplomacy style plays out. I see no problems with it. <laughs> <laughs> Just like, I want all of your... Th yeah. Oh, God. All right, so from Zababa. Hey, sorry for no message. It's been really busy. Joman didn't want to negotiate border. Beelined for the contested provinces and started to fort up. So no can do. Oh, and obviously, I trust my luck will hold. It's my strat for the game. I'm guessing yep, so this is a reference three, to a zero. <laughs> yeah, probably. Okay. Let's start with the Zabalba then, because we know that's one of the conflicts. And, oh gosh. Yeah, he did hit four provinces, but he did bounce one of those. Oh, so all the crossbow are still here. Oh, this is a nightmare. The crossbow are yeah, I mean damage. I guess, okay, there he's we go. blessing everybody. Yeah. So you don't actually need to do hold an attack to bless Sacred Flyers, because while they're in the air, they count as being in the turn that they're flying out of. Right. Or they count as being in the square that they're flying from. Right. So he lost um, but all also the bats, actually... like the basic bats, and then three of the obsidians, but he killed... He took the province, but he also killed 25 of these crossbow. Yeah, none of those crossbows escaped, which is actually really good. Yeah. That's a big deal. And you can also kind of see how useless the regular bats are if you look at the kill counts. Right. But the Sacreds got basically all of it. Yeah, these guys literally killed nothing. But they did their jobs. They died so that the Sacreds didn't. Yep. Would have been cool. He didn't do it, I don't think. Would have been cool to see imps being used here. 
That would have been a way to maybe I... reduce some bad attrition. He does have blood slaves, which is interesting. Maybe this didn't trigger gem. No, no it, it should have triggered gem yeah. yeah. So he he intentionally didn't summon imps then. Yeah. But he still has the slaves, so he can summon them in the next fight if he needs it. Absolutely. So he takes this. It's pretty light. Seventeen of city. Was that warriors. where Joman was fording? Was it? I don't. It's it's important enough to look. I'm gonna pause. Okay. So we went and checked, and indeed this province was being forded. So that is a major blow to Joman. And Shababa had scouted that as well, it's worth pointing out. Like, that wasn't, like, random. Like, part of his decision was, I'm going to hit this guy because he's building this fort here. Right. And, I mean, this is just a casual 6 PD here. No army. I mean, yeah, this could have been pretty easily taken by Indies as well, you know, if there was an Indie attack. But um, Joman's writing Lux Scales. <laughs> right. Oh, wait, no, he's not. That's Shababa's Lux Scales. Oh, yeah, you're right. They've had Joman's writing Misfor Misfortune. And then they get hit. Okay, so this is interesting. So, Oh, so we're finally going to get to see... Now, this is way more power being brought than Joman has on this side. But we we are going to get to see how these Gohamados do in melee if we don't see the commander get routed. Because there's a chance they just route the commander and then none of their stats are going to matter. Given that Joman's guys are in the rear, I... Oh, no. Yeah, the commander walked behind. This is the commander, right? The prophet, yeah. Yeah. Budget thugs. I like that as a prophet name, but I don't necessarily like his positioning. Is this a commander? Is this a no? No, that's just a heavy cav. But he's got. He's he's got yeah, this so other guy too. Where is he? This guy. Both okay. sides. That's the. Um, These are the three PD commanders commander. all the way at the back. Yeah. So uh, interestingly, Shivalpa also brought their prophet. So right. both sides have the prophets in the field. It's kind of fun. Okay, well, we're going to get to see a square fight here, because so far the commanders haven't been killed. What? Yeah, because his prophet is way in the back. Oh my gosh, these guys in the front got deleted. But they did get some kills in, in return. It looks like the Balvin units aren't all coming in at the same time. So the Sacreds and some of the Aussies came in first. So it looks like either they got split up by getting caught on different squads, or they're actually flying in at different times. Ooh, imps uh, they're the imps. I'm guessing... Oh, yeah, because that the cavalry unit died. So it looks like some of the bats got caught up on that. Or not bats. Some of the jaguars got caught up on that. So the Aussies actually got split up, which is partly why Joman's defense got as many casualties as it did. All right, let's watch that again. So we'll watch this cav. Okay, they're taking off. Yeah. Yeah. See? the. So he's got the one anchor bait, Ozolotl, that charged in with the bats, and then that one died. And then the rest of his ozolotls got caught on the cavalry. So they're, they're not all coming in at once. Uh, on the same token, though, these guys are kind of split off from the main pack, too. I mean, this is going to happen in a battle against flyers often. Yeah, but this I, th I would say this battle actually went much better for Joman than it could have. Oh, yeah. I mean, if they get... I mean, for one thing, the commanders survived until the very end. So he loses, loses six profit. obsidian warriors and two Aussies. So yeah, I mean, these guys did pretty good. Yeah, for 14 gold, you can't complain about how they performed. But I think it's the, the resource cost here compared to the, the Ashigar it might hurt a little bit. Yeah, and taking out Gentleman's Prophet is going to be pretty helpful this, because this early on, there aren't that many spells that you can expect Gentleman to be putting out. So the the Prophet's Smite and Morale bonus is actually like some of the more effective magic that Gentleman can deploy right now. Right. Honestly, I mean, there's the losing the provinces this turn, which is a little bit whatever. Oh, this is funny. This is what happens when you send naked bats in. Didn't even bother yeah. to send a, a blood one mage to do imps. Yeah, he, he really did need... Oh, they picked the heavy infantry. Units. That's funny. They did kill the commander. Oh, there's a scout. Yeah, they, they got HP routed first, Ooh. actually. Dude, this scout, they, they, he, he needs a name. Rename this man. Saves the route and then freaking knifes the last bat. He doesn't have any leadership. So the reason that they, they didn't route was that the bats had HP routed first. Do you, you need leadership to that route? I thought a scout would keep people from the PD from running. Well, uh, if you don't have magic leadership, magic units melt. If you don't have any regular leadership, so like if you have only undead leadership on a unit, for instance, that won't keep units from running either. Really? I had no idea about that. 
about that? Yeah, there's a mod nation that ran into that problem where they made the commander like that you get from your province have undead leadership and no human leadership because it was like thematic for the nation. Mm -hmm. But that also meant that they couldn't use PD. Huh. That's wild. Okay, I had no idea. That's super cool. So yeah, bats doing bat things. The scout with the, the valiant single kill. Oh, the Batov died. What killed it? The Shivaldan commander died. Likely a... Well, there's no archers here. Had you been javelins, I guess? Or did the commander go into melee? Oh, oh I think that was the command... scout knifed at the end. That was this guy right here. Let's check. Yeah, yeah. The scout knifed him. Wow. Okay. So the scout did save the did save the fight, just not in the way that you'd expected. Yeah. Okay. Very cool. Now, on one hand, this is a you know a noticeable loss in provinces for for Joman. The real thing I think though is the military losses, losing these twenty five crossbowmen. And then losing these 16 Gohamados. Joman needs these guys. He's got enough troops here where you know, I, I don't think this is like fully over. But if if these troops die, I feel like he, I mean, I don't know. I, I mean, Joman's going to have to play around with PD dumps. And... He's going to have to do a lot of good predicting about exactly when to combine this army and when to split it up. And, you know, Zabalba very soon is going to be able to just... I mean, right now he's already threatening the cap. He can combine all these armies onto the cap. And if he gets on top of it, it's basically game over. So... Yeah, Jomen is still going to get income because he does have that other fort up. Right. So he's not completely dead if his cap gets sieged. That said, I think that there's also something to be said about the fact that Chival was already using effective magic, that he's, you know, doing right. some skeletal spam, he's got his imps out. So there is going to be a difference in terms of, like, how they can actually leverage their mages right now. Right. And imps are going to be very, very effective. I mean, they're going to be an, an amazing spell to cast if he's got a few blood slaves to spend. Um, not just against PD, but, like, for a decisive fight. If he brings five blood mages, you know, that's a really big deal. Yeah, and then the one thing, though, that I would be a little bit nervous about as Shabalba is committing mages without... Because, like, you're basically giving up your research while you're doing that. Right. So what you generally want to do is send all your mages at once, win the battle, and then, like, go back and, you know, keep reading. But if you're getting into, like, this raiding war, right. then you don't really want to have your mages deployed for the, the whole duration. Right. Yeah, that's a good point. And he, you know, I think there's a 500-strength fort... You know, these guys are going to siege well, but we don't see it's, you know, I guess actually if they brought the mages to win the big battle to get on top of the fort, then they could have the mages maybe go sit in a lab defending this province or something and stay yeah, here he, as needed. And then Shivalba can also force recruit way up. So there's actually an advantage to putting a lab there. Right. But yeah, I mean, that was a devastating alpha strike in the war, in this war here against the German. So. Could have been worse. <laughs> I mean, this was even without stealth stuff. Right. Yeah, I mean, it could be worse. But I mean, losing these troops, I think, is really critical. So. Let's come up here to Arco. Oh, War Elephant goes it down. Is an elephant. Let's see how that happened. Ooh, we see protection oh, coming out. Start... Yeah, that's from his mage priest, right? Yeah. I am the guy that, that he was using died. for blessing. Oh, Looks like I just got man. isolated. Yeah. Maybe some friendly fire there, too. Yeah. You point blank shots from the crossbows at the end did him in, though. But this yeah, is significant. Kinda... Losing that elephant, not a huge deal in the scheme of things, but... It is going to probably take the wind out of this expansion party because this expansion party actually needed to come take both of these provinces. I think he's fine, actually, to keep expanding because that army still has a bunch of heart companions with protection. Okay. Yeah, you could be right. There are crossbowmen here. But... Yeah, as long as he puts the mage priest far enough in the back, the Peltasts are going to get the, take the crossbow shots, and then his protection-buffed heart companions should be able to roll those indies no problem. 
Yeah, but they'll HP wrap the heart companions, I think. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, six, five slingers. Yeah. It's... it's definitely iffy, but I think it's still doable. Yeah. He does have this army coming in, too, so he can kind of... And he could combine with this, so... Yeah, he has options. Yeah, he has options. Expands and takes that, the Ichthids. And this actually is significant, getting Ichthids here. It means he can potentially come and contest some of this underwater land. You know, I think Arco wants to fight Joman. You think so? But, yeah, I don't think he's going to be allowed to because of his whole old thing going on. But I think he wants to take those Joman provinces. Yeah, I mean, I mean it's... you look at where his troops are, they're... And he's kind of, Arco probably is up there in the army graph, I think, actually. I don't think that Ulm is going to let him get away with that. No, he's well, not doing Middle of the pack, okay. But, I mean, he's you got guys, here, guys that... here, guys here, guys here, guys here, guys here. He's got a lot of so, stuff. Yeah, so I think part of why it looks like Arco has a lot is that he's using these very expensive heart companions. Or I shouldn't say very expensive. They're not, like, super expensive as far as sacreds go. But these are, like, high resource cost capital in these sacreds. So for its size, his army is actually pretty strong. Yeah. Okay, but I think you're right. It, he's, he definitely looks like he's eyeing this. I mean, this is his biggest army. Yeah. And he did tell Joman he was going to take that province. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, at least he couldn't call him a liar. Yeah, but oh. given what Ulm has on its border, I don't think that it's a very safe war to take. Yeah. The lance catchers and then the, the cab go in. Yeah, very big commitment, but it ensures that he doesn't actually lose anything of value. Yep. Against and 15 heavy I cab, think he's, good. I mean, you don't need to tell, you don't need to send me a word declaration. If I see this on my border, I know what's up. <laughs> this is, all is not happy with Arco. Yeah. So I, I don't think that Arco's in actually a great position to defend against this either. No. Like, we've been talking about how, like, you know, troop matchup-wise, Arco definitely has the advantage, but his armies are not in position to fight Ulm right, right. now. Right. They're spread out. I mean, I think what we'll see is this army is, I think, going to come here this turn. I think you still take these two and try to get these provinces. And then I think you take this. Well, you can't cross the mountain here. It's... So I think this one's going to have to slow walk back up here, and he's going to have to bide his time, I think, until this army gets up north. Yeah, I think he definitely needs to recall that army from the German border. That's for sure. Yeah. But I also think that you're right about the Indies. Yeah. I think it's worth going for them. And I also don't think that, like, I don't think that he should feel at risk of dying just right. because of the troop matchup advantage that we've been talking about, that he's he's going to be able to defend his cap. It's just a matter of, like, not losing steam and still being able to get your other forts up. Right. This just looks like a lot of dudes, too. 44 Rangers? Okay. It's not really that many. Yeah. You need, like, you were saying, like, 150, and, like... Yeah. With 44 Rangers, if you're sending 44 Rangers into the same number of heart companions, like, that's never going to go well for you. Yeah. Yeah. That's going to go very, very badly. But, you know, more more Rangers here. It's got some here. I mean, I think these are mostly to protect this fort from finishing. So Yeah, that would make sense. And he also put 14 PD there. So he actually is giving respect to his misfortune scales. Right. Yeah, misfortune three definitely deserves some respect. Is he pinging these? Now it's a Vettiheim. This Pythium. Oh, a Netter of Kings. Take a look at this. Oh, I really like that guy, actually. He's not great, or sorry, he's not like terribly worrisome as a throne defender because all he's really going to do is like elementals mm -hmm. and. Fire and water elementals aren't nearly as scary as elementals. So, like, he's not nearly as bad as Zeus in that respect. Right. But because he's also an Astral 5 mage, he's really valuable if you can find a way to steal him. Mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, both Astral 5 opens up amazing forging options. He can do rune smashers, which not everyone has easy access to. And he becomes a teleporting Phoenix Pyre guy. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, this, this guy would be, like, wish material for a commander. So... Like he he would be on the wish list if you could if he was wishable with these paths. Yeah, so it's a really good with, commander. Uh, yeah, just as just the way Star Stargazer is just because of the Astro Five. Right, Pythium. Who's picking this one? Pythium or Vadiheim? I think it's Pythium. Pythium. Yeah. Okay. So Pythium 
okay. has some options. Well, you need to what you need to do if you want to do shade mail assassination stuff is you put shade mail and a black heart on your cap nature mage, and then he can be your charm caster. The charm is I, really hard to do. I I mean you Thom did seven, it, yeah. But that thing was around for forever. It's just so hard to get Thom Seven before thrones get taken. That's true. But yeah, Wait, Pythium does research very quickly. Wait, where's Charm? Uh, you, you must have it filtered. Maybe it got denied from Omniscience or something somehow. That could be. But yeah, yeah Charm is Charm is Thom 7. Yeah. And Pythium does have the pathing options and the research progression in order for it to not be like crazy for him to go for that. Yeah, that's true. He basically just needs to make sure that ever, that his other neighbors don't take it first. Right. Yeah, easier said than done. <laughs> but you, it would be super Well, I mean, cool. if they're fighting each other, then, you know. Yeah, I mean, this also but, is yeah. not a trivial throne, so. And and somebody taking it early. It kind of is, actually. Well, um, late age, Ulm can, scales, nations. No, Ulm can take that with Ulm's build, because it's all fire damage. He doesn't have fire resistance. He has fire. Oh, uh, yeah, that's true. Yeah, Ulm, whoever takes it is going to need to find a way to fluff. Uh, I mean, fire Arco has fire resistance, so maybe Arco could. Arco could take it, yeah. Yeah. But I have a feeling Arco would still suffer, suffer a pretty good bit of attrition here. And maybe, yeah, maybe I guess... with like a properly fluffed stack, he could take it with very low attrition. But Because yeah, all the indie units there are like nothing. So really the only damage that you have to worry about is the fire drakes, which are, you know, admittedly very significant. Mm -hmm. And the venomous fangs with 13 attack. Well, they're in cold scales right now. But yeah, I mean, the, these guys with and heat scales are kind of okay. and kind of hurt. Yeah, it's, it's the 13 attack venomous fangs, which are actually dangerous. The fire flare is a low yeah. damage. Yeah. It's kind of so like if I you mean, have scales with strength. Oh, strength of wielder not added. Okay, no. But it is area effect one, so it's always going to hit. Yeah, but if you have 10 FR, then you yeah. can usually negate that one. Yeah, 10 FR will get rid of that. Okay. Moving on. So anyway, this this must break out next turn. Yeah, I mean, with all the stuff on that border, it, it's very clear that that's happening. Yeah. There's a very small chance Ulm decides to beeline down here for the throne, but I think that'd be a mistake. If you don't have something that's going to kill this very cleanly, you don't want to like lose a bunch of units before you start a war. So, yeah, crossbows are actually pretty decent against those monsters because you know obviously they don't have shields, right. but you really need like a ton of crossbows. We're talking yeah. like two hundred. Yeah, and uh, we're we're not anywhere close to two hundred crossbows yet. I, I'm not sure we'll see it any time in the near future because once attrition starts with the war, it's hard to get that critical mass. Marignan might hit it first if it, out of everyone. Yeah, actually, he might. Just because they're not building other units. Right. Uh, coming over to Vettiheim. Kings this to see what's here. A little strange since it's super indie. An easy I mean, province super type. Yeah. Easy province type. Um, I think he's doing bare minimum expansion stuff. So he yeah. wants to hit it with like the absolute fewest units that he are required to take it. He's got these guys as lance catchers, these bowmen out in front. Yeah, those are from his starting armor. We kind of commented on how right. they're just very bad units. Yeah. He's rim that he's slowly walking to the back. This stack could rush Utgard. I don't know yeah, if I think it could. Vadiheim knows that it could rush Utgard, but this would kill him. Yeah, I, th this could probably go straight to his cap, unless, unless Utgard's at enchantment five. Yeah, yeah. I was trying to think about like what the what the statue itself could do, outside of just like being a sack of hit points. Yeah, yeah. It con like five could do it, kill it, <laughs> but unless they could get yeah. nuked by some area of effect thing. Oh, uh, and they get wave. attacked here too oh, by dire wolves. That's a lot of wolves. Holy shit! It's like a hundred wolves. Yeah. Luckily, wolves are pretty easy. Yeah. It's going to be some experienced stars. Yeah. I mean, look at those guys go. They're just massacring them. Yeah. I don't know experienced stars on these guys yet. Come on. This guy's got one. Okay. Okay. Well, he's also pinged this. I want to take a look at the guards. wizards here. So I think we know where this Vetti army is going. 
Yeah, so wizards can be really threatening depending on the pathing, and so that guy is going to make some fire elementals, which can, you know, do some damage. The rest of them, like, they're going to make yeah. little elementals, I right. think, which aren't nearly as terrifying. And this is cold one in late winter. So next turn it will be neutral temperature neutral. scales. Yeah. Which is going to affect how good the fire elementals are. So... Um, Vettiham doesn't have fire resistance in their bless, so the Rim Vetti actually do care about big fire elementals. Oh yeah, that's going to delete a square basically every attack, so yeah. pretty scary stuff. Well, uh, I mean, not quite, because, well, actually no, because they're going to have only like, what, 17 or 18 protection? They'll be, they'll be whatever we see. I, I don't oh, well, well, they're, they're protection yeah. 20 in that's... 3. Yeah. So yeah, this is their base stat. So it's, they're only going to be at 14 protection because it's going to be cold zero yeah. or, you know, neutral temperature. And it's basically yeah, so going to be the unit. They'll get deleted by fire elementals. Yeah, so I, I don't think he, he goes for that fight then. Not unless he knows something we don't. Like he tests it and sees, oh, actually he cast this instead. Right, right. Yeah, just because I know that Vettiham's player is going to do that test. They're... You could like maybe if you split them up in a certain way because the the Vetti the Rim Vetti will kill the fire elementals reasonably quickly, but also kind of get fucked up by fire shield. But they have magic weapons at least. That's like the kind of silver lining in that scenario. So if you can kill them fast enough, I don't know. Still seems messy to me. Yeah, Alt Five just makes it a lot easier. It's probably yeah. worth waiting. Yeah. Okay, and then Micklin. Yeah, nope, that looks like, just like expansion. Yeah. And uh, Gath and Micklin have agreed on border, so the fact that he sees those units on his border shouldn't be too scary. Right. It looks like he's going to take this next turn. I was thinking he was going to move up here to take this underwater province, but it appears not. Well, um, he don't, had only seven rain warriors in that army, and that's just not enough. Yeah. King of Rain here. Maybe he's sight yeah, searching the. Oh, wait, no, this is capital. Yeah, Wait, so he was definitely going talking, underwater here. And he had been talking about setting up the King of Rain. So that's his first Holy Three recruit. Yeah. They're sometimes worth profiting if you care about the morale stuff from fanaticism. Micklin generally doesn't. It's usually preferable to just have a more mobile Holy Three guy who can fly around with your Aussies. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Then, I guess that could be like a Nahuli or something. Yeah. If you have undead leadership in your bless, you can also, uh, yeah, if you have undead leadership, then you can definitely do that. Otherwise, you probably want to wait until you get one of your death summons. Okay. Because the, the poochies can fly around. Yeah. I mean, you can also do um, the undead crown or whatever if you get some death, death pathing. Um, oh, that's true. Yeah. Which, for Aussies, doesn't matter. It gives you a big morale bonus, but Aussies don't care about that. So Yeah, because they're 30 morale base. Yeah. Okay, so I think that's Micklin. I mean, things look really stable. It's, nobody's going for this, which is a little interesting. I mean, it's a tough pop type, but I don't think this would be something Micklin should have any trouble with. Maybe this was agreed to go to Pam. But... It's also possible that his stuff just wasn't in position. Like, you really yeah. do need critical mass of Jaguars, and if there are, like, you know, over on the other side of your empire, right. then it might just take a little while to gather up the dudes. Yeah. Oh, he's also making Hoberg Crossbowmen here, too. So that's kind of interesting. Homer not... crossbow makes sense. I don't see, like, there's never any reason to not make them. Size one crossbows are great. I'm a little surprised at the Hoberg militias, though. Yeah, maybe those are blood hunters, or I'm not sure. It might be that he wants to use them as lance catchers to take that throne. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's also possible. I mean, he, he definitely does have a, an enormous amount of stuff over here. The Iron Throne? Yeah, that would be kind of sick. Yeah, Micklin loves having earth magic. Yeah. So I think you're right. I think that's what he's doing. I think he's he's getting ready to go after this throne. It makes sense. The only thing is that if people do end up all attacking him, a lot of these peripheral territories are going to be harder for him to defend. So taking it, if you take it with no losses, there's no reason not to. But if you take it and you lose, you know, 15 jags, you might have needed those in a war. Well, he knows that Shabal is not going to attack him. So on that right. border, it's only Vidiheim that's a threat. Yeah. I thought we had the message for I think we had a message maybe a while ago. 
his four neighbors are all talking. So even if Zabalba is attacking Joman, Zabalba may, if everybody else attacks Miklin, you know, because Zabalba can just fly somebody from his capital and take it. You know, it's not like a... Sure. Yeah, it doesn't require any commitment. It's literally within flight range of his cap. Right. So we'll see. But yeah, I think this is what he's doing. I mean, and like you said, this would be super sick to have. It, it, was he fording this? No. No, it was just... Wait, where was the fourth fort? I felt like he had a fourth fort underway. Um, He has two under construction right now. Or one just finished, it looks yeah, like. This so, is the and one, then... This is the, the other one. And then he has a commander next to his cap, so that's probably going to be another fort. Yeah. Or actually, he has two commanders next to his yeah, cap. Yeah, he's got um, these, but not, neither of them are going up yet, so... No, he, he has another commander just... Uh, one? Yeah, that one. Yeah. So he's got, like, a bunch of different <laughs> bunch potential of fort sites. Yeah. Okay. I mean, maybe if you didn't make all these scouts and commanders, you'd be able to afford your next fort. <laughs> yeah, I'm a little surprised about the commanders just because he has the scout sitting idle. Just like send a, a scout down, that way you can save the 15 gold. Right. Okay, and Gath. Well, this is a Micklin scout ping on that throne. What's this one? Throne of stars. Gath gets attacked by Indies here, survives. It takes this. So this is a tough province. 13 heavy cav. So this guy limped. Oh yeah, diseased. Yeah, he's on the the Gath retirement plan. Oh yeah, this one is another really hard province, but it looks like he basically just got luckier this time than he did the last time he fought a similarly hard province. In that he routed the infantry first, and that HP routed them. Because uh, if he had been stuck like in melee against those thirteen heavy calves, that could have gone bad. I mean, it, it was close. I think a, you know, a morale roll could have gone and this would have swung the other way. So, yeah, it was close. It killed those militias, though. So, I mean, it, I, th I think it worked out that, like, yeah. as long as he lived long enough to kill the militias, he was going to win by HP route. Right. And uh, it's got another army here. Presumably this is going to go after the Jade Amazons. And uh, expanded up yeah, here we, towards we... this easy province you were talking about with the Zots. Yeah, we kind of called it just because the other two provinces are too difficult for that stack. Right, because right, this has heavy calf. I am very surprised that he's going all in on slingers, though, just because the slingers need buffs to actually be good. I think this means he's going after Micklin. Yeah, that's just throwing his mercenaries away. Yeah. Yeah, so that's... I mean, that makes sense, I guess. Yeah. Having dual wielders, or cheap dual wielders, I should say, is very good against the jaguars. They can trade decently well once you have Strength of Giants and some protection buffs on them. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just, they, the difference in their performance with and without those buffs is massive. So if you don't have, you know, Ench 3, Cons 3, Alteration 5, it feels bad to use these guys. Okay. Yeah, I mean, he can also do Flaming Arrows. That, well, no, Miklin has Fire Resistance, so. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, he's definitely hitting the troop button. I mean, he's making these slingers out of his cap and out of this fort. So. I, I have a feeling we're going to get to see him in action. I mean, he could just be doing this to patrol for, you know, getting blood hunting going, but. You've got cheaper patrol options, though. And then the right. other thing is that because he's not taking such a, a like, a, a build that emphasizes his bless, it's also just going to be a little bit lower value, right? Like, his CR aren't going to be as strong. Right. That's kind of like partly why I like a bless with Drain Gath is that all the pieces kind of fit, right? Like you get your Levites, which use your bless, and then they're also the patrollers to help you get right. Seer that also use, yeah. Anyhow, ways, that's not what he's going for. Right. The other thing that I'm a little surprised at is that he hasn't yet labbed his Crystal Sorceress province. Right. Where was that again? I forget. Some um, just to the west of that fort. Uh, yeah, that, so that's, yeah, okay. that's Crystal Amazons. So that would be like a good thing to get up early just to start side searching air. Because if he's he going to want to temple this. Now they can make the sages, right? Without the temple. The the I no, the sages do the Isaacarite sages, the research guys do require a temple. Okay, wait. It's the second from the left. These guys. Oh, they do. Okay. Yeah. yeah damn. Yeah. So he's they he actually, must be making the they don't need a lab. I'm guessing that he put a lab up there first to make his giant mages, which are going to be both his sight searchers and his early troop buffers. Okay. 
because he already does or like he has been spamming those sages from his capital yeah but you're right that if he w did just want more research then it would make sense to put the temple up first yeah because you don't actually need a lab to make those guys right 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 because they've got the they don't have the full uh, magic path they've just got that, that yeah they can you can occasionally get chance. yeah and the Astral One guys that you get from that are kind of nice just because they have your Bless. So if you took like a, a Bless that has a bunch of resistance stuff, then you can use them as Astral Mages in your army and they'll be resistant to battlefield effects and stuff. Mm -hmm. okay. But otherwise, yeah, they're uh, brats. So yeah, so we'll probably see Gath rolling out to take this and it looks like they're gearing up for a war with Miklin. Which guard? No real movement here. They've kind of yeah, been pinned in. I think he was reconsolidating to go try to take that heavy calf province that Beatty right. just beat him to. Yeah, I think you're right. And I don't think Utgard's going to have much to say to Beatty Heim, considering this deck could probably just go bing bing and take his capital. Unless he has Enchant 5, which he probably does with the Idol of Beasts. But yeah, okay. I, the other thing is, I don't think Beatty Heim knows that he can kill Utgard. All he sees is that there's this big pile of Garm herds bordering him now. Right. He doesn't know that's literally every unit Utgard has. <laughs> Which is not normally your assumption, right? When you see an yeah. army, you don't normally think, oh, this is literally all they have. Okay, coming over to Agartha. Oh my goodness, all right, so here we go. This is the next war. We've got Agartha attacking here into Midgard, and he's, how's he raiding? Crossbows behind these drakes. Yeah, I mean, this is basically just his expansion parties, right? Yeah. So, makes well, total sense, that's he what he's got. Use, he didn't really use any crossbows. An expansion. Uh, right. So this is anti-elf tech, right? I think the idea is the elf are going to get hung up on killing the knights for forever, and the crossbows are going to shoot them. Yeah, the majority of the gold in that army is in those cave knights. Right. But yeah, that's what he has after expansion, so that's what he's going to be using. Right. Yeah. In terms of new production, though, he's doing province. a bunch of crossbowmen. And uh, we can see some uh, penumbrals coming out here, so that's kind of exciting. We'll get to see these being used early. And and the cover art for this, like the the thumbnail, Aaron, who's playing Agartha, specifically requested I put penumbral as his kind of the, the Agarthan avatar in the the throne room. So they're great units, and one of my favorite things about them is that they're stealthy. So right. on a nation that can make shade mails and has great death mage leadership, um, it's really easy for you to actually make the stealthy raiding parties using these guys and a guy casting buffs on them. Yeah, it's a great point. And, and then, and there's a lot uh, of buffs life... you can put on them too that are really good. Like Agartha can do quickness, they can do iron warriors. So, yeah. Yeah, with, with these life drain units, they benefit a ton from both strength and protection. Yeah. So while they start out being already actually very good units because they're doing typeless armor piercing magic damage, mm -hmm. uh, they become amazing with buffs. Yeah, they really are good. And then, yeah. um, and how big are umbrals? Are they five or four? They're four, right? Ten umbrals are size three. Umbrals are the big guys. But are they four or five? I think they're four. Do you yeah, let me check real quick. I want to say that they're four as well, but I'm going to just double check it real quick. Okay. But yeah, umbrals are four. Okay. So, yeah, you can't stack a penumbral and an umbral in the same square, but you can put two penumbrals there. But you can put an umbral in the same square as a human mage, which is kind of cool. So, yeah, I mean, there's just a lot of stuff here from Agartha. And from the Midgard perspective, they're also getting attacked oh, by T and Chi. Yeah, you know, at Conjuration 3, he could also start be doing Shard Whites. So Penumbrals are better in terms of, like, power per unit if you can put buffs on them, right? Mm -hmm. Because they've got that life drain and stuff, and they're very versatile like that. Shard Whites are good if you just need to get, like, a ton of units on the field. Right, just because you're not you going to get... be point buffing them as much and stuff. Yeah. Because they've because got higher got... protection and stuff out of the box, right? Yeah, they actually wear armor, so they have 16 protection. And then they still have the Shard Glaive. So they're actually, right. they still have like a magic attack. And their base damage is a little bit higher as a result. Right, right. So it's what's what's their attack score? 11, but with the Shard Glaive, that goes up to 12. Yeah. And then, of course, they've got the Cold Aura. So right. Shard Whites are kind of like, if you aren't planning on like supporting your guys with your mages, if you just want to get like massive combat power out right, right now, they're a little bit more efficient. 
which is often why you tend to see them early game for Elia Gartha. By going for the pet numbers, he's kind of um, already saying like, hey, I want to be using a buff oriented strategy. And that's also going to fit with what they had wanted to do with the cubes as well. Right, 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 right. Yeah, he did He did say I could also do a cube as his avatar, I think. Um, so yeah, here we have King Dark Chi attack, attacking Midgard. And... So he didn't wait for the fort to finish, but he also didn't bring enough stuff. Midgard definitely saw this one coming and defended in force. Right. And I think you were commenting last turn, like it, you wouldn't really necessarily think too much of it because there wasn't a ton on the border, right? There was like 20 guys maybe here, and then there were like, you know, three or four guys here and here, and then there's a big army here, which Midgard might not have been able to see because it wasn't really a border province. And so, yeah, like, I would have attacked a turn earlier though, because yeah. TNG did have enough on the border to do the raiding parties, and bringing it over like those extra guys didn't seem to have made a big difference. Yeah. It's interesting so, yeah, that he also but... said that he had spells to lock down elves, but he didn't have nearly enough troops in order to actually take advantage of that. I think he was expecting to just hit. 6 PD here. I don't think he was... Which kind of makes it weird that you put a mage with this army, but... Yeah, that's what I was thinking, is yeah. that, like, he brought that mage specifically as, like, an elf counter, or at least, you know, that's what he had been saying his research was going towards. But you don't have enough troops there in order to actually make that work. Right. I mean, maybe if there were, like, six vans and then, like, 15 PD, maybe that's what he thought, like, a suspicious Midgard might do. You know, take like one expansion party, put it there with a little bit of PD and be like, this will keep this up from a low commitment raid from TNG. Maybe he was like, this should just barely beat that budget defense. But Midgard was like, no, like these are literally probably most of the vans he has and 20 PD. So very high commitment from Midgard. Like if Midgard lost this fight, however, he'd be done. Yeah, but, and I'm guessing... So the other thing is that we'd been kind of musing that TNG might have wanted to wait until the fort was finished so he could take it. Right. I'm not saying that he's not. He's He really is just attacking. Yeah. Calf here just suffering from some bad RNG and melee. They should have killed those guys. But the squad size is too small, though. That too. I mean, that's the morale failure at the end. But I think they had five at the beginning. Yeah, but, like, as soon as you lose one unit, then right. you're taking a check every hit. So, like, at that point, yeah, I, I, I would basically never go with fewer than six because right. that both gives you that extra buffer and that's three full squares. Right. Whereas in this one, like, you have one guy at the end who's on his own. Yeah, this was six and that was a lot cleaner. Or seven, so. It was also easier province defense, right. to be fair. Right, right, right. So he's one for three in his attacks. They what? were all fairly low commitment, but he, but like, uh, with the exception of the fact that he sent a mage along with one of them. Right. Now, while it sucks for Midgard that he's getting 2v1'd, like that sucks a lot, it's good for Midgard. Not only 2v1'd, he's getting 2v1'd early. That's the first war on the map to break out. You don't really want to be the recipient of and being a 2v1 as the very first war, which happens before turn 12. It's probably going to put a kink in your plans. He was pretty much done expanding, so that's nice. Right. That, like, there were a couple more indie provinces that he could have gone for. Yeah. But, like, I think he's generally ready to fight. Yeah, he's but got his he first doesn't... fort up. And most importantly, he won this first war. So that's, like, hugely important, actually. Or this first battle. Like, if you lost it, this is the best way to start off a this kind of unfortunate scenario. Yeah. I'm not sure the best way to defend at this point, though. Usually what I try to do if I'm in one of these situations is very quickly rush one of the two people, but I don't think he's in a good position to rush TNG. No, I don't think so. I mean, he could yeah. try to, like... I think, so I think this is the thing, back. is, like, this is obviously the most contentious province, right? So it's like, and TNG is set up to attack it, right? So do you, if you're Midgard, do you all in and defend here? Right. Yeah, um, I think that I split that into three different groups, one led by each of those van hearses that he has, and then hit three different provinces. Yeah. I hit two on the border there, and then the forest province that TNG just took. Okay. The vans should be able to reach that, I think. Yeah. Oh, they don't have cold move, though. Well, I mean, they, they are fast. They're and fast. That's only... I think they can... Well, yeah, they should be able to hit it. 
Yeah, so I would hit those three and then reconsolidate where it looks like like TNG is pushing with the PD dump. And then after the second, like army wipe, if you like actually manage to kill a bunch more TNG stuff, you might be able to talk them out of the war or yeah. like actually go for the throat, especially if you can get one more person to help you kill them. The super risky move is taking everything here and attacking this province. Because... I don't think you can do that. You lose the bounce, though. Like, there's a lot more TNG stuff. So if he moves into you, you're fighting in your own province anyways. Right. If he moves into you, you fight with your PD, right? Which maybe you would win. Yeah. Right? If you move into him, that means this army probably wouldn't have moved elsewhere. And then you take this province and you're between, like, if he moves here, you're between the army and the cap. Yeah, I'm not saying think... that's a good move, but I'm saying it's yeah, like a, I don't that's like a, that a balls out move. I actually don't think that Van head to head beats TNG. Like, if all of them have all of their army in the same province, I think TNG still wins that. Yeah. And I think there's going to be a decent amount. I mean, we see ancestor vessels here. It doesn't seem say much for the mages, but presumably he's got a bunch of these nature guys casting web too. So you really do want as much of a numbers advantage you can have with with Midgard, which means you kind of want to play on the defensive. Because, like, if he's going to be having, like, five webcasters and you've got 30 vans, you really want PD there to distract units while your vans are killing stuff. You don't want to be outnumbered fighting into five webcasters. Yeah, and then the other thing is that he's not really going to have... He's not really going to be able to actually use his mobility advantage very well if he doesn't, like, immediately go for, like, a raiding-style offense like I was talking about. Yeah. Because if you're, like, outside of that, you can't really get your armies from fight to fight if all the fights are just, like, you know, a death ball thing here, right? Like, you yeah. can't... It, it's going to be very hard to win a defense in detail, basically. The, the other option that he maybe has... So one thing is... You kind of want to defend this fort going up. You could also cancel it, too, and be like, fuck it, we're giving up on this fort. But the other option is take the entire army and move down here. And while on paper that seems like a bad move, or maybe you move part of it here, yeah, you could move here, actually. And unless it gets pinged by Agartha, nobody would see it. Or maybe split it. But the nice thing is, like right now, with most of the military power up here, Agartha kind of has free reign. It would be kind of interesting if... You, you take your army here, you move it south to defend this, and then you move this army over here where you can threaten a true full force consolidation against Agartha and win some battle like truly decisively. And that might allow you to pivot back on TNG. Yeah. The reason that I would say that going for TNG first as opposed to Agartha is that you can actually threaten TNG, and I don't think that Vanheim or Midgard can threaten Agartha right now. Just in terms of, like, the troop composition and stuff? More in terms of the positioning. Like, it's gonna, just going to take him too long to make Agartha actually worried. Like, he just can't do enough damage quickly enough. Because he has to first... Like, if he if he moves his elves down, like you were saying, right? Yeah. Then he's defending one of those provinces. And he's giving up four provinces, right? So he's he's making... He's giving up four different provinces to... Or actually, more than that. He's giving up two to TNG, three to Agartha, potentially. I well, guess he defends no, I mean, one he of them. Take so more like... I mean, he could even split this army up and take, like, just control these three provinces this turn, right? If TNG doesn't attack this province with a significant force, that's going to mean he actually loses no ground to TNG, might kill raiders here. And then and... he only loses two provinces to Agartha. Yeah. Yeah. The, the problem, I think, though, I is that... that I... My mindset when I get in a 1v2 or something, like when I'm on the, the, the Midgard side of this is I'm, I actually don't really love the rating strategy unless it's for a higher goal. And like, yeah, and, the goal unless, in this you, case unless is you to... think you're actually just going to straight up win, like not like, like, yeah. So the, the goal with rating TNG like that is basically that you force TNG to split up while you're using very mobile guys that can reconsolidate. So you're basically able to take some territory back. So you get like, you know, a little bit of gold swinging back into your favor. And then once you once TNG has like responds to that by actually not having all the stuff in one death ball, then you can actually win a battle against him. Yeah, right. So in that case, the goal is to like force the enemy to separate, and then you defeat him in detail. And I think that's like a worthy a worthy goal for rating. But I wouldn't like. There's a lot of players, especially elf players, tend to do this. They're like 
you know, it's like ride or die, except it's a raid or die for them. And they're like, oh, I'm going to fight you. I'm going to raid until like, I can't raid anymore. And it's like, especially in a situation like this, like raiding should serve a higher purpose, I think. Like, and that should be eliminating an army, right? Yeah. The other thing that I am, I would be worried about with trying to do the defensive thing that you were talking about, where you control that area in between them, is that if you keep losing territory like very quickly at the start of this war, then you're just going to get outproduced. Yeah. Well, I mean, the thing is, I mean, kind of, right? Like, you only need enough gold to power two forts. You know? that. In, in my opinion, every single thing subordinates to being able to eliminate player armies at this point when you're in a 2v1. Like that is by far and away, that is the, that's the way you'll either win the conflict outright, or it's going to be the way you negotiate peace with one of them and turn it into a 1v1. Oh, I agree. I'm just not sure if there is a viable way to kill the armies by just trying to ball up and play defensively, unless you're going to hit some sort of research time and let it let you swing these fights, yeah. which it doesn't look like Midgard's heading towards because they have the Volvas. Right, well, which are there, you know no, there's interesting things with that, right? So like uh, cheat fate's really interesting. It's obviously super early on Vans. Cheat fate's oh, yeah. on Vans is really good, and obviously if you do... combine it with body know. ethereal, like cheat fate and body ethereal on Vans versus crossbows and cave drakes is going to be ridiculous. I would actually be worried about crossbows just chipping through the cheat fate. Yeah, that's why it actually works really well with body ethereal too. So if you imagine. Yeah, like, I... You know, you spread know your vans the, uh... out. You have archer bait so they don't immediately get plinked down while you're doing the buffing cycle. Yeah, I know that cheap fate is like one of the things that's surprisingly good just because it's late in the resolution. So right. all the other things that can prevent the damage first trigger first. Right. Which makes it pretty good yeah. when you're stacking. Including mirror stuff image. Yeah. So. Oh, I think I lost you there. Nope, still here. Okay. Yeah, including mirror image, right? So, you know, mirror image only you know, once it, it, it fails to block, it's gone. And Cheat Fate can keep that from happening. So it's kind of cool. Any other things you think? He's got Volvas. What else could he do? I think it's just buffing. I don't think you want to mind burn into this or something like that. Yeah, no. I mean, mind burns not off or paralyze aren't awful into the actual cave drakes. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, the cave drakes are basically just tanks. They're not really doing yeah. the damage. And they also have 12 magic resistance, so they're not even, like, that low MR. They're just kind of, like, it's helpful just because they have such high HP and high protection. But, yeah, you don't really have any, like, killy stuff with it. It's definitely not no, nowhere near as impactful as air elementals. Right. Yeah. No sign outside of air of elementals, stuff, though. Yeah, outside of stuff like larger Raga, I pretty much always want to do air elementals first as Midgard. Okay. Well... It's going to be really interesting. I, I you know, I, I hope what we don't see, like, he needs to use his troops and his mages at the same time. And right now, all his mages are in these forts, and his troops are all out here on the front. So maybe that's another way to look at it, is like, how do you position this so you can get the other players to all in, and you all in at the same time, and you bring your mages, and your mages, are, you have more mages, and they're doing more useful things. But, yeah, I mean, he does have that defender's advantage of that your guys are still there reading books. So, right. and Garfa has not mobilized mages that I've seen, not so far. Uh, but, I don't think that he's going to send his has. mages out yeah. until he sends the penumbrals out. Right. Okay. Like I think those guys just go together. Yeah, I think you're right. Moving along, so that's a pretty cool. War, Pangea, nothing happening. Troop movements indicate they're looking at Midgion, though. That's who I'd fight, honestly. Like, yeah. as Pangea, I, well, last time I played Pangea, I actually opted into fighting Marignon, even though it was, like, a little out of my way, just because I think that matchup is so pan-favored early game. Yeah. We're starting to see real production out of Marignon, though. Like, we're getting near the point where you've got 100 crossbows, and then he's... I don't like... I especially don't like crossbows with Royal Guard, though. Jesus. Yeah, Royal Guard in particular are just not great against Pangea. Yeah, I mean, they've got decent amount of stuff, but the thing is, is like, they're gold expensive, and you're mixing yeah, them in with gold. a crossbow stack, they're going to get murdered by your own crossbow so badly. And Seder Snipers. And then they're also not, their attack stat isn't particularly high. 
like 13 with a great sword is fine but the centaurs are reasonably going to block those with shield hits a fair no amount of the time and they have the hp and protection to just out trade them yeah. especially considering that they're lancers themselves so i would take cataphract into the royal guard basically any day so we actually have an interesting situation potentially evolving here too because there's kind of one obvious move for this Marignan army, which is to come here and take this contested province. And they may not see this Pangea stack here, right? Which will combine with this stack of, of snipers and hoplites. So The only thing... Yeah, so I think that if they have negotiated borders, it's most likely the case that it was a two and one rather than that Pangea gets all three. Mm -hmm. So if they're bumping here, that basically means that Pangea is fighting Marignan. If yeah. Marignan takes this without a bump, it probably it means that they for sure have negotiated borders. Most likely they're probably going to or already do have a nap. Yeah, I think you're right there. And then over But I also think that LA Pan is a nation that should be played very aggressively. So like the fact that they're they, they don't have all of their stuff in one place. Like you can kind of see that they've got some stuff on that farm, and then they've got stuff kind of scattered around like vaguely towards the Marignan border. Mm -hmm. That like they're not really in a position to go start a war like this turn or next turn. Yeah, I mean, they've got 60, 40, they've got 120 troops up here, another 40 here. Now, some of these are mercs, though, and they're going to be going away. Yeah. More guys down here. But yeah, I mean, they've got, they must be kind of higher on the army graph, right? With all the mercs. Yeah, no, they are, I remember them being up there. Yeah. yeah. Number two. So, and most of it's on the, the Marignan border, so we'll see. I have a feeling they're going to be aggressive, but. I think they should be, yeah. Yeah. Or maybe they know how bad Marignan's events are and they don't want to have to deal with the horror cult and stuff. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the true, de the true defense is, is they're thinking about Micklin, right? Because they are making a lot of ranged units. And they are, while they're kind of on the Marignan border, they're also kind of on the Micklin border. So it's, it's another Yeah, they're not really in a position to fight anyone. I think that Micklin, it would make sense for them to fight only if they have like support doing it or if they scouted Micklin's Bless. Yeah. Because, like, if Micklin had gone, like, full Hellbless and spammed Eagle Warriors, you don't want crossbows into that. They'll just get massacred. Right. Yeah, that's a good point. Okay, so we'll get to see. I think either way would be a reasonable option for them. I don't think you want to be in yeah. a 1v1 with Micklin with this build, though. Exactly. Yeah, with if, if they saw that Micklin is making a bunch of Rain Warriors, then, yeah, you can go for it. Because Rain Warriors just aren't that good against crossbows. Right. Uh, Jaguars at least have a trim, you know, are way more tanky than Rain Warriors. So yeah, they have the second form. I mean, Rain Warriors have more protection, but like that, they don't There's have a shield. Those, so it yeah. doesn't matter that much. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, the vastly lower HP and the fact that Micklin's Bless seems to be like very specifically synergistic with Jaguar Warriors makes them just much better in like a troop fight. Yeah. Okay, so that covers that. Both of these guys brings us back to Agartha, which we've covered. Coming over to Pythium. Oh, did we cover Marignon? We, yeah, yeah, we must have. Yeah, I mean, as, as well as we can. Yeah. Atlantis. No hostilities yet with between them and Arethia. But they're both massing on that border. Like, I wouldn't even be surprised if Arethia is patrolling that fort. Because yeah. Atlantis had that army, like, where it is now last turn. So it kind of looked like Atlantis was looking to push. Right. Yeah, I think this was a patrol, actually. I think they were patrolling here. And that's probably fine with Arethia, because we're like, okay, you're distracted over here. We're going to finish putting this fort up. <laughs> and then they're going to have yeah. all these forts on the Atlantis border. Yeah, and getting four forts all spamming out data shows this early in the game is great. Yeah. And they're capped to Citadel, too. So, like, although we did see that he started with the princesses first, which is interesting. Yeah, let's take a look again at the research graph. We've got Pythium, number one, Utgard, number two. Yeah, this early in the game, it's basically going to be the awakes counting for everything. Right. What we what who's, uh, who's in the next tier is that Arco? Arco is number three. Oh, Marignon also had no number researcher. four. Yeah. Wait, their researcher hasn't been researching then. Look at the how the graph wobbles. Yeah. Oh past... no no, the, maybe it's that their researcher is researching, but all their other mages are not. Or maybe Could it's be. no, it's outside searching. There it is. Where is it? It's Here it's it in is. the yeah. Cave. yeah. Okay. okay, so he's site searching. Found an air shaft. Hasn't found much though. Marignan probably the lowest uh, gym income right he, now. I think he just started. Like yeah. I think this is the first turn I think he's it's out. Three turns. Uh, well, or second turn. Second turn. Yeah. 
Yeah. So last turn he moved out, this turn he searched, and that's yeah. what he found. But yeah, if you if you look at the delta, Arithia is near the bottom there in terms of like where their line starts, but right. it's shooting up. Oh wait, no, that's someone else. Who's the gray one? Uh, oh, that's, that's Gath. Gath. Yeah. That's that's that drain build. Okay, yeah. okay. So they've just been spamming those sages and getting well, but they, you know, okay. they, they they've only got it's only out of the cap. Yeah, but you get yeah. three per turn. Yeah, that's true. All right, I so actually thought Aresia would be doing better, but yeah. I guess I guess the fact that they went for the princesses early means that they act, they've been getting basically half as many mages as they could have, or princes, I guess. Right. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, Cold War brewing here between Atlantis and Aresia. Nothing more to talk about there. Pythium positioning down here to take this throne. It looks like the throne of growth, which for Pythium they've got growth one, so they're gonna enjoy growth three it looks like oh that yeah that's very fortuitous throne of growth is just one right or is that throne of gaia that's throne oh of gaia, gaia. Yeah. yeah yeah throne of life is the one that's plus one growth gaia is plus two right right right. okay right so they're gonna be very happy with that yeah so they've got a lot of scales thrones near them oh man another growth throne yeah basically all their thrones give like bonus scales that's kind of sick yeah and it's actually scales that they can all use too yeah very fortuitous. Yeah, they could become... If they get all these, they might get pretty close to being a full scales build. Yeah, I mean, it, it would be growth three, order one. That's yeah. not bad. And, uh, yeah. Okay, but not much uh, Not much else to talk about here. TNG, we've kind of already covered with the war with Midgard. I guess the only things maybe to add here are... They really are slamming barb-heavy horsemen in the back, and presumably they've got a whole commander logistics network shuttling them to the front. And the crossbows, very oh, right. importantly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, Those guys are going to be too, very actually. valuable against the elves. Yeah. yeah. But uh, I can't remember he if He also made a Fords. Master of the Way, which is interesting, because that's their cheaper mage option. So it's possible that he wants to put a lab and temple somewhere to start doing foreign recruitment. Yeah. Or maybe just do a lab and temple to for like an actual fort. One or the other. Did he have a fort he was putting up somewhere? I don't think so because he commented that he was spending all his money on army excuse me yeah i think that's right i think he's all in on this first war which i think is and to me that's the most interesting way to play late age tng no for no first fort just put everything into to troops yeah I he like has it. to be careful that he doesn't fall behind in research though right because tng is very much a snowball nation and like most snowball nations you can't just rely on units right but he had mentioned that, I think, in the first message. He's like, I feel like I'm going to be really strong at the very beginning, but then I'm going to go through like a period where I'm really weak, where I'm behind in research, because all I've been doing is making troops and attacking somebody. So, but if he gets some forts out of it, you know, he can catch up kind of quickly. But yeah, it, it it's going to be a very challenging transition for him, though, I think. Yeah, I think you're right. He um, really needs Midgard's cat, basically, if that's his plan. Right. Or for this fort to finish and take that. But even then, that's only two forts. You you know, you're not going to be a very happy two fort nation, even if you do have a bunch of gold and gems from conquering somebody. Yeah, it would be great to get their cap. And he can definitely use those air gems as well. So like going for like with a two cap nation, then you basically start investing in infrastructure and you basically set up forts in between the two capitals, mm -hmm. which conveniently enough, one of them already has a lab. So you basically fort like that area, and then you get six forts that are all touching each other, which isn't great for like resource stuff, but you don't really care about that a huge amount as TNG because you kind of have like, troops that are balanced in terms of like rec and re recruit resource and recruitment point costs. So you, for you have that like central area forted, which becomes right. like your mage hub, and then you can red pretty easily redeploy to any of the borders. Yeah. I mean, TNG also can, they don't need a fort to make troops, right? So you can, I mean, if you're holding down the troop button, you're going to have a lot of troops, no matter how many forts you have. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think you're right. I think it's more about like having the mages centrally located where they can kind of, you know, move to the, to the correct front for war. But yeah, I mean, let's see how TNG is looking on the army graph. They're probably going to be very high, yeah. They're number one. Some of this is because horses count as size three, right? So they're going to be... 
you know, count three, three they're times as much as it had a Gablin. So it's probably a little inflated, but... But on the other hand, their units are also a little bit higher quality and more expensive, right? Like you're yeah. paying 25 gold for those heavy cavalry and they're worth the 25 gold. That's true. That's very true. So yeah, I mean, they're well positioned to, to fight this first war. This dip, like you can see, it was actually increasing at like a ridiculously high rate here. Like this is a lot of troop production. This dip here is actually from them losing that bump, I think, or losing two of them. Yeah, they lost 16 yeah. units here and they lost probably like five units here. So, but yeah, their, their num numbers still went up. They just didn't right. go up by as much. Right. So, yeah, I think that's pretty telling in and of itself that they can afford those losses, no problem. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, Midgard's so much lower than them on the army supply. Look at that. Yeah, and you can't even make too much of a quality argument because, yeah, I mean, they do have the vans, which are very nice, but those guys are probably not as gold efficient as TNG's troops. Yeah. Yeah. So, anyway, it's going to be pretty inter interesting to see play out. It's going to be a really hard position for Van to, or for Midgard to, to wiggle their way out of. Yeah, I don't think they win that war without elementals. Yeah. They, they just, I think they have to really outplay both players here. Yeah. Okay. And then boy, that brings us back to where we started with Ulm and, and Arco things heating up. So, and we're, we're past an hour here. So any, any closing thoughts? I'm just glad to see that the game as a whole is suitably aggressive. But, and it also seems like, like you were saying that everyone like seemed to have done pretty well expanding overall, you know, with a couple exceptions and some hiccups here and there, but people clearly knew what their early game expansion plans were and then transitioned that into their first wars very cleanly. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, even the, the people who are being fought against here, right? Like the people who are the war targets rather than the war choosers. So Midgard and Joman, they, they've got their act together. And, you know, Joman kind of got caught a little bit with their pants down just with, you know, they've actually lost troops here in this when they got attacked but you know they've got a bunch of stuff still they've got a god that's about to wake up with the ghost king so i feel like we're gonna get the uh, decent wars even if you know however it plays out I, I feel like nobody was caught like completely sleeping in their, yeah in their first war not yet anyway yeah there was no like ganging up on someone who had failed expansion it was really right. just yeah so cool yeah so well, thank you so much for joining me once again, Sai. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. And the viewers, as always, thank you for tuning in. And I uh, hope you're looking forward to seeing how these wars develop and mature. And uh, we'll probably have a few more wars starting soon, too, as all the players probably don't want to be left behind. So tune in next time. Cheers. <laughs>